Uh, without further ado, hey, Alfred, great to see you, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, and and I just want to uh, say say a shout out to my very dear friend and colleague. We've been at this now since 1982 when we first met at the second special session um, and and at the UN Outer Space Conference in Vienna, doc, Dr. Cal Rosen, because it's she who's the international director of the Institute uh -huh. for Cooperation in Space. I was once that in a while, and, and we got the uh, Space Preservation Act and Treaty passed by Congressman um, Dennis, Dennis Kucinich to prevent the weaponization of, of outer space. And I really, really urge all of the viewers to support that. Mm -hmm. um, I, am, uh, I am currently uh, your humble scholar and reporter at exopolitics.com and author of The Omniverse. Wow. Alfred, I, I guess to get things rolling, uh, you, you have this label as the founding father of exile politics. Uh, tell us about that label. I mean, most people, there are still people out there, they go, exile politics, what? I'm, I'm, excuse me? They don't, they don't understand it. So tell us a little bit about that as a definition and, uh, and why it's inception and uh, we'll lead into where it's at now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, exile politics is a new science. It's, uh, for example, to use an, an analogy, it's like anthropology or political science, but it's the anthropology and the political science of outer space, uh, of the universe and of the multiverse. The multiverse is a collection of all the universes of time, energy, space, and matter. And, and so for a word, we just say exopolitics. And what that means is the relations among all of the civilizations in the multiverse. So uh, in, in very simple terms, let's say within our own solar system, there's a great deal mainly below the radar now mm -hmm. of exopolitics going on between Earth and our nearest planetary neighbor, which is Mars, because there's been a secret colonization of Earth of Mars by Earth since the 1960s, uh, believe it or not, a secret partnership between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, some reports say that there's upwards of 500,000 U.S. colonists on Mars. Now, uh, in simple terms, I would say that the mm. U.S. strategy is to attempt to circumvent the U.N. Outer Space Treaty, which prevents any single nation from laying claim to a celestial body by covertly uh, attempting to make Mars the 51st state and thereby to acquire right title and interest to all of its mineral wealth and, you know, and using Mars as a staging area for the first further colonization of the rest of the solar system and this segment of the universe. So there's 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 kind of a modified real Star Wars going on there. Uh, the putative head uh, during this period of the Mars Colony Corporation was a fellow who flunked out of Yale when he was a sophomore and I was a freshman. His name was uh, Richard B. Cheney. Uh, he's a guy who, as a judge, uh, in of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal, I had judged, uh, along with my other fellow judges, as a war criminal for his role in the illegal invasion of Iraq and the use of torture uh, against uh, international law standards. And there's uh, slave labor going on in, in the factories and uh, on the Mars, on the secret Mars colonies now. So it's kind of an, there's a, you know, a real mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of the ills that we see in the military industrial complex now is happening even to a greater degree on Mars because uh, 
people are brought there under false circumstances and then they don't have any civil rights there and there are no courts and they say they're kind of stuck there. And, and um, that's part of the excesses which are going on in what we call the dimensional ecology of the omniverse. In other words, we're on a very impacted planet here. There's still a tug between the good guys and the bad guys, the forces of light and dark. And uh, uh, my book, The Omniverse, its purpose was just to you to bring science and uh, newly emerging, emerging science to areas that have traditionally been within the areas of myth, within the areas of belief, within the areas of sacred text, which may or may not be entirely scientifically correct. Alfred, could you explain in your book, you talk about uh, the universe and you title it in a different ways, multiverse, omniverse. For our listeners today, could you go through and describe those definitions so they understand what we're referring to throughout the hour? Yeah, yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, if we go back to the Sumerian astronomers about 3500 BC, at least within the conventional history, uh, they were the first ones to bring forth the concept of the universe. And the our universe, uh, you can say, is a, is a discrete, organic, holographic creation of time, energy, space, and matter, including multiple timelines and an ecology of dimensions. It's like a self-contained whole. It's, it's like an, an organic self-contained whole. And in, in 1895, the next sort of uh, 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 advancement in an understanding of cosmology occurred when the American uh, uh, psychologist and novelist Henry James coined the term multiverse uh, to mean the, total <clears throat> the totality of all universes. And so that multiverse means all of the universes. There's more than one universe. There's not just our universes. There's, according to two Stanford scientists, a, quote, humongous number of discrete, organic, holographic creations of time, energy, space, and matter, which are composed of multiple timelines and an ecology of dimensions. Now, I just want to take a footnote here and give people an idea of the actual number of universes in the multiverse. And that is that, according to these two Stanford scientists, the number of universes in the multiverse is so large that our human mind could not cannot comprehend it. However, if we if we would sit down to write out that number, say in twelve point type, that that number would be more than two hundred and sixty million miles long. That's how large the number wow. would be <laughs> that would designate the number of universes in the multiverse. So that's what we're dealing with, how large the multiverse is. Now, take that and fast forward to 2015 with the publication of the first scientific book in history, formally, on the omniverse. So you're going from 3500 BC with the Sumerians to 1895 to Henry James to 2015 to yours truly, Alfred Lamont Weber and the book, The Omniverse. And what the omniverse is, it's a very simple 
uh, equation. You know, like when Einstein brought in a very simple equation to describe the relationship between the speed of light and mass, E equals mc squared. It's a very, very simple equation uh, uh, that uh, describes that as as time slows down, mass increases. It's very, very simple. Well, the omniverse, here comes the, the equation for the omniverse. The omniverse equals the multiverse. In other words, all of the, all of those universes, that number that's 260 million miles long, plus the spiritual dimensions. And what the spiritual dimensions means is number one, the intelligent civilization of souls, spiritual beings and source or God, what in many cultures is called God. And the reason why we're including now the spiritual dimensions of the intelligent civilization of souls, spiritual beings, and God in the equation, which is a scientific issue, is that now, for the first time in history, we have replicable scientific data that prove, more probably than not, that according to the scientific method, the intelligent civilization of souls, spiritual beings, and God exist. Whereas prior to this, that had been a matter of faith. And if we examine this historically, what occurred is that with the occupation of certain manipulatory extraterrestrial civilizations like the Anunnaki. When they came in prior to the Anunnaki occupation, essentially exopolitics was scientific. With the Anunnaki occupation and the dumbing down of humans, mm -hmm. 12 strand DNA light beings in the third dimension to two strand DNA essentially, uh, wage slaves, the Anunnaki sought to, to make that area of, of the spiritual dimensions very fuzzy for the humans, the area of souls, the afterlife, the interlife, spiritual beings and God, very fuzzy, very dependent on faith, very dependent on revelation take away all the science, and the Anunnaki introduce themselves as the gods. And that's why you say, see, even now, uh, all the kings and the popes, they have these hats. They, the hats all look alike, and the hats of the kings and the popes looks like the headdresses of the Anunnaki in the artwork of the Sumerians, uh, because the kings and the popes are trying to uh, imitate themselves as gods. Wow. And, and, but the, so that the omniverse, the science of the omniverse, the historical significance of the publication of the science of the omniverse with this book, the omniverse, is that we're now breaking through that information embargo and we're reintroducing the, the intelligent civilization of souls, the afterlife, the spiritual beings, and God as a matter of science and not as a matter of faith. And we are liberating humanity from the entrapment uh, that the manipulatory ETs, the uh, Anunnaki, the Draco reptilians, the uh, Orion Greys, and all of those who were participants in the system-wide, in this segment of the omniverse, of, of our universe, rather, uh, they engaged in kind of what was called historically the Lucifer Rebellion. That is now coming to 
an end, and it's the book, The Omniverse, that is kind of the 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 uh, nail in the coffin of that because it establishes in science and reaffirms in science that there is an afterlife, that there are souls, that there is God. So it's it takes away all that manipulation, mystique, fuzziness that was introduced somewhere between 200,000 and, and a million years ago as a means of controlling humanity. Anything having to do with religion, government, or money is a tool or tools that were introduced by manipulatory ETs to control humanity as a part of this rebellion over the last segment of history. And all of that is coming to an end now. When you see the Akalu figurines with, the, like you say, the little, what looks like a fish costume worn straight upwards with the mouth of the fish like that, and that's the bishop's hat or the, the pope's hats. I mean, I, I, I point that out to people. It's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, are we saying that the Akalu sages were mimicking somebody else or and that the bishops are just a lineage of the Akalu? Or are we saying that these guys were, um, it was the, the, Roman patriarchs mimicking the Apkalus. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that there's there, there, there may be specific times, but if you go as a general archetype, mm -hmm. the 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 general archetype of the Pope's uh, a hat and the king's crown uh, goes back to the headdress of the Anunnaki who presented themselves as gods. And, and so uh, uh, when the king, is the king or the queen is crowned, or when the pope is crowned, that is the symbolism of representation of God on the planet, mm -hmm. which is archetypally, they're stepping into the shoes of the Anunnaki occupation, which is a cosmic manipulation based on fuzzing over uh, uh, the science of the omniverse, and it's based on the political might and the corruption mm -hmm. that occurred uh, when uh, the upper reaches of the planetary administration uh, rebelled uh, in the distant past, 200,000 or so years ago. And, and so uh, that is why uh, concurrent with uh, the release of the book, The Omniverse, politically and socially, we began to call for a regime change on the planet to move away from the farm team that we have governing the planet now, which are essentially the remnants of the Anunnaki. Do you ever see that that manipulation and control ever having a break? Has it been right there since our inception? Has it been full on hardcore manipulation and control of our, of our species since day one? I think so. I mean, even if you go say, and look at the quote revolutions, those were manipulations of the bankers. Uh, those were kind of uh, intra matrix inside baseball manipulations. If you look at the Bolshevik revolution, the Bolsheviks uh, were led by, uh, uh, it was a financing of the city of London uh, Rothschild and 13 families that went and recruited a bunch of Brooklyn uh, socialists and brought them over to Russia and then got hold of the Russian Revolution and Bolshevism was crypto-Zionism. And the same thing happened with the Cuban, with the Cuban, with the Cuban Revolution. I happened to be in Cuba at the time and my mother's family was was Cuban, and my uncle 
was the Jesuit handler. He then became the Jes the deputy black pope of the Jesuits, the deputy head of the Jesuits. That is another kind of uh, manipulatory cult, and uh, uh, he he was the handler of. Fidel Castro. So it was a pseudo communist, pseudo communist revolution, which really was a Jesuit Zionist front. And, and all of these things are just, uh, manipulations to, uh, keep, you know, it, to, to kind of divert the progressive impulse in humans and make them think that there's progress going on. But, Nothing is really changing, and and, and so uh, uh, essentially we've been inside of a matrix, a controlled matrix, uh, for about two hundred thousand years, and now that is now coming to an end. The planetary quarantine that we've been under for the last two hundred thousand years is coming to an end. And with the release of the information that is contained in the book, The Omniverse, uh, as that disperses in humanity and propagates, uh, we will gain uh, autonomy because it's based on the sovereignty of the individual human soul. I have a question, Alfred. Um, how do you take into the, the whole storyline here, the context, the historical context of shamanism with the indigenous cultures, because they have a lot of myths and stories and cave paintings and such that show a very reciprocal relationship with star beings that they call them star beings. And they have a wealth of information that a lot of people don't access or have access to. Uh, and they don't talk a lot about them. So how do you see the shamanic? access into the multidimensional universes that include the spiritual realm, along with the scientific, along with all the other levels that have been documented, very well documented through pretty much all indigenous cultures? That is an excellent question. Um, and in fact, I believe that that is one of the primary reasons why the matrix controllers have engaged in a uniform policy of genocide against the indigenous cultures uh, that accompanied, for example, the colonization of the New World. Most recently, I'm very familiar with that, with the genocide of the Canadian Aboriginal population uh, and uh, was involved here in Canada with a series of, of uh, popular based tribunals which showed that over 50,000 uh, uh, Canadian Ab A Aboriginals were genocided in terms of the residential schools which were introduced in the 1930s through the 1950s in order to eradicate the Aboriginal culture and to land grab the Aboriginal lands for the minerals. And I believe that the same thing has occurred in, in the U.S. where, uh, with the, with the, uh, when the, uh, settler nation, the United States of America engaged in deliberate genocide against the uh, Native Americans, and I, I just want to say that I'm I myself, you know, I've been tested for DNA, and I have Native American Native American DNA, and you know I have uh, uh, sought to become aware mm -hmm. of that, uh, and and there um, uh, uh, there was germ warfare, bio warfare. Dishonoring of treaties. Uh, 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 there, there's been all, there's been a complete campaign of eradication 
of the Native Americans and eradication of the Native American nations. And I can recall being at the United Nations during this second special session on disarmament with the Hopi delegation there. I used to hang out with them at St. John the Divine Cathedral, and I helped the elders of the of the uh, Hopi inside the UN building because I was a a registered NGO representative. I I helped them inside that building get to their get to their meetings. There there was a delegation of 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 Hopi elders that that were fulfilling their prophecy to prevent what they called the House of Micah, that's the UN headquarters, Micah being glass, and if you look at the UN headquarters, it's sort of a glass building, and and they were, uh, uh, there was a prophecy that there would be nuclear war coming about. And, and so uh, I've been intimately involved in helping facilitate the Hopi, elders meet with the UN to forestall nuclear war. Now, that is very complex because because of certain actions of the being Gaia Sophia, which is the soul of the planetary avatar that we know as Earth, uh, on December 21st, 2012, Gaia Sophia and Earth uh, reactivated its own organic timeline that that those of us who are aware and committed uh, 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 you know beings of earth and and sovereign souls are now on that uh, uh, earth timeline we're not on the artificial timeline of an off planet uh, invading, uh, predatory artificial intelligence, which is one that is looking to uh, looking to turn this planet into an artificial intelligence planet and robotize us humans, what we call the transhumanist agenda, so that another reason why we've released the Omniverse book at this time is to give sort of a uh, guidelines and blueprint to provide a blueprint to the community of aware souls as to what the scientific basis for the omniverse is. So that's one more tool in providing mm -hmm. the community of aware souls so that they aren't sucked into the transhumanist agenda and uh, uh, become AI and trained robots, which is happening to many, many humans, because right now it's proven that all of us are infected with Morgellons disease, which is every human on the planet has Morgellons. And that's proven through the red wine saliva test. And Morgellons is one of the tools for the DI through the DNA transformation from human to robot. Wow. Um, you talk about spiritual dimensions in the omniverse. Um, I, I, I love this because I, uh, for a long time I, I used to try to talk to people about um, ufology or any aspects of it and if you had to mention spiritual essence of it, it was always about nuts and bolts and, and spacecraft and how we would go and go to a planet and, and all this and you know um, it's just I for a long time I never seen the question addressed so I, I just see the evolution of that now um, perhaps you could just talk about and I think probably maybe the hyper dimensional civilization's role in the omniverse uh, maybe just talk about some of that structure of spiritual essence of the omniverse sure sure well um, that uh, just his historically 
that came about because the I would say the resistance uh, on this planet, uh, the forces on this planet that are committed to the artificial intelligence, and that is to create a planet of war, disease, crime, and poverty, created a term called unidentified flying object, which, as you stated, focused on the the um, focused on the nuts and bolts uh, aspect of it, and which prevented going into any depth as to what the manifestation of the uh, interdimensional or multi-dimensional aspects um, of the of the um, uh, of the dimension based the dimension based the, the dimension based the dimension based civilizations are and um, one of the roots of the of this book that occurred uh, there were two things that gave birth to the book the omniverse and one occurred in July of 2009 and the other occurred in August and in July of 2009, I was doing a book tour of Spain on my new book on, on, on uh, the Spanish translation of my book, Exopolitics. Mm -hmm. and, and I was being interviewed by um, Ima Sanchez, who is a reporter for La Contra, uh, for La Vanguardia, which is like the second largest newspaper in Spain. It would have been um, uh, uh, it would have been like the Washington Post of of, of Spain, um, and um, uh, so she asked at one point during the interview. She asked Alfred. Tell me how the universe functions. What is the relationship between extraterrestrials and reincarnation? And I saw at that point, because I had been focusing in my book, Exopolitics, entirely on the universe and the multiverse, which are entities that are composed of time, space, energy, and matter. But ever since the Sumerians because of the Anunnaki intervention, the whole spiritual dimensions has been cut out of the universes and the multiverse. And even string theory, modern string theory has carried that to an extreme where they, they just want to go to extremes in defining what the universe is and defining what the multiverse is. But there's a phobia in modern canonical science of investigating the afterlife, of investigating the intelligent civilization of souls, of scientifically investigating God, scientifically investigating spiritual beings. In fact, it's verboten inside the scientific canon. It's, it's, it's verboten inside universities with one or two exceptions to examine that. Mm -hmm. So that that I saw in that moment in that interview that that Ima Sanchez was asking questions that had to be addressed and in order for me to answer her questions in a systematic way I had to go beyond the book that I had at that moment which was Exopolitics which dealt only with the universes of time, space, energy and matter. The second thing that happened was that in August of 2009, Oxford University Press, which is a division of Oxford University, asked me to write a book on extraterrestrials and the law. 
And in the course of writing that book, I saw that there was no adequate existing typology, at least, at least in the public domain, of what an extraterrestrial civilization was. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, there were things like the, the Kardashev scale, which Dr. Michio Kaku has popularized, in other words, which says that there's a type zero, type one, type two, type three civilization, and we're a type zero trying to become a type one, a type zero, it has to do with sources of energy. In other words, uh, a type zero civilization uses its own nest for its energy, like fossil fuels. And a type one uses the energy of the universe, like solar or free energy. And most type zero civilizations self-destruct before they get to a type one, which is our big issue, right? Mm -hmm. But that is not the core. That is not a core typology for civilizations. And so what I discovered was what we call a dimension-based typology of intelligent civilizations, which is if you talk to intelligent civilizations in the multiverse, they self-define themselves by the dimension in which they, they're based. They'll say, I'm an Acturian from the sixth dimension or the sixth density. Mm -hmm. I'm a Plydean from the fifth density. And each of these densities uh, revolve around states of consciousness, revolve around their relationship to time or not. There's very little relationship to time in the fifth density. Uh, it's more a uh, relationship to love, concepts of love, uh, concepts of uh, telepathy, concepts of teleportation, concepts of manifestation and concepts of closeness to deity or source. So once, so what we were able to do then, and this was in conjunction with the preparation for the book that Oxford University Press asked us to prepare, we prepared the uh, dimension-based typology of intelligent civilizations. And that was the basis that provided the foundation for uh, the conceptualization of the omniverse. In other words, we had to go in stages. And, and once we did that, then, that's what broke us out of what you can call the UFO ghetto. In other words, a UFO is just not an object. A UFO is a manifestation in this dimension of an intelligent civilization that is based in another density or dimension that has generated a wormhole to come into this dimension to either observe or interact with us. Wow. And and then I began to interact with researchers uh, like Will Allen of UFO DC, who was a crew member uh, for under three administrations on Air Force One, and who now takes photographs of interdimensional spacecraft that come into this dimension and land on the U.S. Capitol. They land on uh, U.S. Senate and House of Representatives congressional office buildings. They overfly the White House. They land in underground bases adjacent to the White House. They are known to the U.S. Capitol Police, and that is the most protected airspace 
in North America. And they're doing it interdimensionally. So then uh, we were able to use that data because what we've done in the book, The Omniverse, is to proceed uh, on the basis of empirical data and according to the law of evidence. Now, there are two types of evidence. One is legal evidence and one is scientific evidence. And in legal evidence, you have documentary evidence, uh, you have witness evidence, uh, and you have physical evidence. So in this case, we have photographs of these interdimensional craft which have come in through the wormholes. And what happens is that Will Allen has been implanted by these interdimensional uh, ETs so that he gets a signal to go out and uh, uh, then will photograph the ET craft coming in and landing. We, he has photographs of the ET craft landing in the reflecting pool in front of the Congress. Uh, but not only that, he has multiple photographs and he's a top photographer for magazine, for fashion magazines, for motion pictures, for record companies. So we're getting this top, top, top quality, quality photography. And he's photographing the wormhole itself and the interdimensional spacecraft coming through the wormhole. So we're getting a very high level of physical evidence and documentary evidence of that that is accompanying what we now can conceptually state is an interdimensional uh, intrusion coming from another dimension based uh, dimension based dimension based civilization and then from that we can take that even one step further and go into the area of galactic governance because uh, our galactic governance, for example, if we take the galactic governance of this planet, Earth, and the origin of Homo sapiens on this planet, Earth, the Homo sapiens project, we, we being examples of Homo sapiens, antecedes or comes before the predatory Anunnaki intervention. The Anunnaki intervened in our planet, and what they found was that we were a 12-strand DNA light being in the third dimension because we had been genetically engineered and created by a consortium of upper dimensional, uh, inter upper dimensional intelligent, intelligent civilizations that are part of the governance structure of this region of the galaxy, including the Alpha Centaurians, the Pleiadians, the Syrians, and others. Those are kind of our galactic structure. However, they're not only in 3D. They're in 4D, 5D, and above. So uh, with this understanding and information, we can now uh, approach this. And uh, as evidence of this, uh, and this is all in the book, The Omniverse, mm -hmm. We we uh, we interacted with a lifelong NORAD officer, uh, a colleague of mine, <clears throat> who was based in Winnipeg, whose job at NORAD was that he oversaw the jet fighters, the interceptors, who were deployed every time a UFO came over 
and intrude it into the North American airspace, which is the 3D airspace. 3D being a time-space continuum, time-space hologram airspace. So he was very familiar with all of the UFOs. And a UFO means that it comes in from another dimension, creates its own wormhole, and then comes into 3D. And these are like probes. They, they, they come into our, into our airspace like probes. And, and so uh, after he retired, he was contacted by representatives of the Regional Galactic Governance Council that said uh, that this was through a telepathic contact. And they said, look, we are going to manifest, we're going to choose New York City, and we're going to manifest our fleet. We're going to decloak our fleet over New York City on October 13th, 2010. And we're choosing New York City because the people are, are blasé there and because it's the UN headquarters. And uh, uh, so my colleague uh, wrote a book and he put that on the cover of the book and I thought he was crazy <laughs> for doing that, right? <laughs> At that well, level. yeah, I mean, it's just like, wow, <laughs> you know, like giving exact dates is something that you don't do, you know, when when they tell you that in telepathic communication. Yeah. I'm you curious know? if you think about CERN and how it relates to all of that, what you've been talking about and the, the new discoveries that they've been having. And what, can you work that into the progression of what you're talking about and give us a little bit sure. of sure. about sure. that? Yeah, I, I would be happy to. But, but just to finish up uh, this story very, very quickly, on October 13th, 2010, the Galactic Fleet manifested over New York. And we have pictures of, you know, these hardcore New Yorkers at the corner of, you know, uh, West, West, I remember West 23rd. That. I remember that actually. Yeah, I remember when that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so uh -huh. if, if we're, uh, but, but if we're talking about, Stur uh, about CERN, um, uh, I believe that there are three functions to CERN, okay? And CERN, hello? Yeah. Okay, good. We're here, yeah? Yeah, okay, great. I believe that there are three functions to CERN. And CERN, like Morgellons, and like Harp and Chemtrails, and like the internet itself, is a tool of an invading, uh, predatory, artificial intelligence that is trying to terraform the earth now uh, and uh, to its own image. It's soulless. And, um, and there are three functions to it. The first function to CERN is, has to do with the Schumann resonance. And what CERN does is that it increases the Schumann resonance, which is normally about 7.8 hertz. And so CERN has been increasing reportedly up to 11 and 12 and sometimes even up to 17. And what this does is it takes the resonant frequency of humans from 7.8 and up to 11 and 12 and even up to 17. And it just, it's blowing everybody's mind and disorienting them. And what that does is that it facilitates the terraforming of humans into robotoids, accelerates the terraforming of their DNA to where uh, they can be transformed so that their avatars, the avatar being Alfred and everybody else, you know, listening to the program, uh, who is not really firmly anchored in their soul, uh, uh, you know, their soul would have problems incarnating, kind of staying in that body 
so that then the body becomes AI entrained and they become like a Bill Gates or a Prince Charles uh, 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 who are spokespersons for the AI. They become robotoids themselves. And that's what the CERN does. That's one function of it. The second function of, of the of CERN is that it produces what are called strangelets that are nano black holes. And with these nano black holes, which they can concentrate around events and locations and targets, that itself is another accelerator uh, to disorient humans and to accelerate the terraforming both of, of Gaia Sophia, of the Earth, and of humans into the artificial intelligence timeline, the artificial intelligence Earth, and humans into the artificial intelligence robotoids. The, the, there's a struggle going on between are we going to be on the Earth organic timeline or on the AI, artificial intelligence timeline. The third function is this. There is a specific word for it, and it's kind of a biblical word for a dimension that is very, very dark. And it's a dimension where some very dark entities, notably the ones that were leaders in this rebellion, these are dimensional entities, have been imprisoned, you know, and they took the devil and they bound him down in the pit, you know. And one function of CERN is to attempt to or open a portal into this dimension. The, we're talking about the matrix controllers who are essentially diabolically oriented to open a portal into this dimension so that all of these very, very evil, you know, in the polarization of good versus evil, would be re-released, would be released back into our time-space hologram so that all of the struggle that we star seeds and that our predecessors uh, in the first kind of recapturing of Earth which, you know, happened with the landing of Buddha, of the Christ, and we kind of indigo star seeds are like the second wave. That would all be erased, and we'd be back to square zero. So that's the third function of CERN. Now, so there's been a tremendous fight around CERN, and we've been told about whistle by 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 whistleblowers and by others that there's a tremendous battle and concentration there. And the good news is that CERN essentially so far has been essentially neutralized. Uh, so that, that would be, uh, you know, uh, a summary of where CERN as a tool of the artificial intelligence in this battle within the dimensional ecology of the omniverse, the battle between the among the spiritual dimensions, the intelligent civilization of souls, our role in this universe, because we're 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 in a very targeted universe here. Now people say, oh, should I be afraid of that? No. We all chose to come here. In fact, this is a highly prized incarnation, and we get a lot of soul development brownie points for having incarnated in here, in this universe, because our souls come out as highly developed. We, we come out as hardy souls, as very powerful and hardy souls, and we're sort of, uh, you know, at, at the forefront, so... It's like, have no fear and just carpe diem. Wow. Uh, I guess the final question, we're at the top of the hour, Alfred. Um, can we talk about the role of the Archons and maybe just bring in the Nag Hammadi Library and uh, just explain who the Archons are on their role uh, as you see in the Omniverse? 
Sure, sure. You know, and that and that ties in with the inorganic artificial intelligence that we've been talking about. The the inorganic artificial intelligence is a sentient, either machine based or plasma based intelligence, and there's kind of a spectrum, and the archons are probably right next to the AI. And uh, because they are organically based, uh, uh, and we have people can go to exopolitics.com. Mm-hmm. The, the archons are discussed in the book, The Omniverse. And they are they work symbiotically with the AI and say if you went right next to the archons would be the manipulatory ETs like the Draco reptilians, the Orion Greys, and the Anunnaki that are manipulatory ETs that have become AI and trained. And the difference there between the archons is that the Archons go back to the creation of this universe itself. Well, there's a couple of theories. One theory is that, as you know, there are a humongous number of universes in the multiverse. And the party that creates the universes, and we're in a free will universe, and uh, incarnation into a, and one of the missions of the universes, uh, and of a universe is to serve as a venue for the incarnation of souls for soul development. Comma, and another mission is that the totality of the spiritual dimensions, in, in other words, as a collective, the intelligent civilization of souls, spiritual beings and God collectively create the universes because each soul is a holographic fragment of God. And the principle of holography is that the whole is contained in each part of the whole. In other words, each of our souls is God scientifically. And that's why you say namaste. I salute the God within you. Each, each of us is God period. That's what it is. And, and so, each of us is involved collectively in creating this universe as a collective. And our mission, what we do between lives, is not only incarnate. We're deployed in tweaking universes, going into universes, creating solar systems, creating galaxies, tweaking galaxies, tweaking solar systems, tweaking planets, creating new species. We're like the gardeners of the universes. And so in the create, and it's a free will. And it's not perfect. It's not a perfect process. <laughs> There's free will. So <laughs> what happened is that in the creation of this universe, there was a glitch and something happened and Archon's came out of it, you know, this, these kind of dark beings that were like mind viruses, okay? So that's the archons. An alternative explanation is that there was a portal and there was a rule that you could not go near that portal and some adventuring spacefarers in this universe said, eh, we're going to go. They opened the portal and the archons came in from an adjacent universe, okay? So there's more to know because we are just, we've been in quarantine for about 200,000 years because of this re- rebellion. So I think that exopolitics is one of the most exciting careers that anybody could engage in on planet Earth because it's just really opening up. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions and I feel that I've been privileged to play a role in this. And I've got two books out now, Exopolitics and the Omniverse. And uh, I just think, you know, it's great. And I think people should really 
if they're not turned on to it, you know, they're, I mean, we've put them up there. It's really inexpensive. You know, you can get Exopolitics now. I think I put it up there on Kindle for just a few bucks. And I think that now over Cyber Monday or they had, uh, they were running the Omniverse for half price. And, you know, this stuff is invaluable information. <laughs> it's just costing you about the price of a latte at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. so for go sure. for it, folks. Well, wow. Alf, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you today. An hour is not enough. We'll have to get you back sometime soon. Uh, the Omniverse, Transdimensional Intelligence, Time Travel, The Afterlife, and The Secret Colony on Mars by Alfred Lambermont Weber. Um, get yourself a copy of the book. It's fascinating. There's a lot of stuff in there that we didn't get to, Alfred, obviously, but that's the purpose of reading the book. Um, and it covers so many uh, specifics in there. Uh, I like the way it's all tied together, though. Um, and I like the layout of the book as well. Like, sometimes you get books that are thrown together, but this one is nicely structured. Uh, it's easy to follow, and it's compartmentalized into uh, some sorts of genre for the reader to follow. And uh, I like that as well, because um, it it's a minefield of research. So... Um, thank you for your time today, Alfred. Thank you, Alfred. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both, and I and I feel privileged to have been a part of your program. And, uh, we'll leave into where it's at now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, exopolitics is a new science. It's, uh, for example, to use an an analogy, it's like anthropology or political science, but it's the anthropology and the political science of outer space, uh, of the universe and of the multiverse. The multiverse is a collection of all the universes of time, energy, space, and matter. And, and so for a word, we just say exopolitics. And what that means is the relations among all of the civilizations in the multiverse. So uh, in, in very simple terms, let's say within our own solar system, there's a great deal mainly below the radar now mm -hmm. of exopolitics going on between Earth and our nearest planetary neighbor, which is Mars, because there's been a secret colonization of Earth, of Mars by Earth since the 1960s. Uh, believe it or not, a secret partnership between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, some reports say that there's upwards of 500,000 U.S. colonists on Mars. Now, uh, in simple terms, I would say that the mm. U.S. strategy is to attempt to circumvent the U.N. Outer Space Treaty, which prevents any single nation from laying claim to a celestial body by covertly uh, attempting to make Mars the 51st state and thereby to acquire right title and interest to all of its mineral wealth and, you know, and using Mars as a staging area for the first further colonization of the rest of the solar system and this segment of the, according to two Stanford scientists, a, quote, humongous number of discrete, organic, holographic creations of time, energy, space, and matter, which are composed of multiple timelines and an ecology of dimensions. Now, I just want to take a footnote here and give people an idea of the actual number of universes in the multiverse. And that is that, according to these two Stanford scientists, the number of universes in the multiverse is so large that our human mind could not cannot comprehend it. However, if we if we would sit down to write out that number, say in twelve point type, that that number would be more than 260 million miles long. That's how large the number wow. would be <laughs> that would designate the number of universes in the multiverse. So that's what we're dealing with, how large the multiverse is. Now, take that and 
Fast forward to 2015 with the publication of the first scientific book in history, formally, on the omniverse. So you're going from 3500 BC with the Sumerians to 1895 to Henry James to 2015 to yours truly, Alfred Lamont Weber and the book The Omniverse. And what the omniverse is, it's a very simple uh, equation. You know, like when Einstein brought in, which may or may not be entirely scientifically correct. Alfred, could you explain in your book, you talk about uh, the universe and you title it in a different ways, multiverse, omniverse. For our listeners today, could you go through and describe those definitions so they understand what we're referring to throughout the hour? Yeah, yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, if we go back to the Sumerian astronomers about 3500 BC, at least within the conventional history, uh, they were the first ones to bring forth the concept of the universe. And the our universe, uh, you can say, is a, is a discrete, organic, holographic creation of time, energy, space, and matter, including multiple timelines and an ecology of dimensions. It's like a self-contained whole. It's, it's like an, an organic self-contained whole. And in, in 1895, the next sort of uh, 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 advancement in an understanding of cosmology occurred when the American uh, uh, psychologist and novelist Henry James coined the term multiverse uh, to mean the, total <clears throat> the totality of all universes. And so that multiverse means all of the universes. There's more than one universe. There's not just our universes. There's Uh, without further ado, hey, Alfred, great to see you, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, and and I just want to uh, say say a shout out to my very dear friend and colleague. We've been at this now since 1982 when we first met at the second special session um, and, and at the UN Outer Space Conference in Vienna, doc, Dr. Cal Rosen because it's she who's the international director of the Institute oh. for Cooperation in Space. I was once that in a while, and and we got the uh, Space Preservation Act and Treaty passed by Congressman um, Dennis, Dennis Kucinich to prevent the weaponization of, of outer space. And I really, really urge all of the viewers to support that mm -hmm. um i am uh, i am currently uh your humble scholar and reporter at exopolitics.com and author of the omniverse wow alfred I, I guess to get things rolling uh you you have this label as the founding father of exopolitics uh Tell us about that label. I mean, most people, there are still people out there, they go, exopolitics, what? I'm, I'm, excuse me? They don't, they don't understand it. So tell us a little bit about that as a definition and, uh, and why its inception. And uh, universe. So there's, there's, there's kind of a modified real Star Wars 
going on there. Uh, the putative head uh, during this period of the Mars Colony Corporation was a fellow who flunked out of Yale when he was a sophomore and I was a freshman. His name was uh, Richard B. Cheney. Uh, he's a guy who, as a judge uh, in of the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal, I had judged, uh, along with my other fellow judges, as a war criminal for his role in the illegal invasion of Iraq and the use of torture uh, against uh, international law standards. And there's uh, slave labor going on in, in the factories and uh, on the Mars, on the secret Mars colonies now. So it's kind of an, there's a, you know, a real mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of the ills that we see in the military industrial complex now is happening even to a greater degree on Mars because uh, people are brought there under false circumstances and then they don't have any civil rights there and there are no courts and they say oh, they're kind of stuck there. And, and um, that's part of the excesses which are going on in what we call the dimensional ecology of the omniverse. In other words, we're on a very impacted planet here. There's still a tug between the good guys and the bad guys, the forces of light and dark. And uh, uh, my book, The Omniverse, its purpose was just to you to bring science and uh, newly emerging, emerging science to areas that have traditionally been within the areas of myth, within the areas of belief, within the areas of sacred text.